But as I look out, um, I see a congregation of distinguished New Bold Church members, and bolstered, as I said, this weekend by those of us who came to New Bold in the 1970s as bright young things. Now, of course, if, if the truth be told, not all of us were young. And based on my performance at uh, secondary school, we weren't all bright either. So I did think at one stage of preaching a sermon on some things I learned while I was at Newbold. And of course, I did learn many things while I was here. When I was at secondary school, I scored less than 1% in my mock O-level physics exam. But once I arrived at Newbold, I finally did learn something about the laws of thermodynamics from Albert Watson in Matter and Energy. And also, rib reserve breathing from Frank Wood in Fundamentals of Speech. I was introduced to exotic vocabulary, such as vis-a-vis -vis and per se, from Jan Paulson in Biblical Theology. I can still rattle off the present indicative active that I learned from John Dunnett in Greek 1, learned what a real sermon sounded like from John Woodfield. Of course, I also learned how little I did actually know from Harry Leonard's helpful marginal comments on my essays for Reformation history. But once I'd graduated from Newbold, I realized that the college hadn't, and in fact couldn't, have given me everything that I needed to know about the world, the church, or myself. And at the time when I received the email from the principal, Dr. Baldham, inviting me to preach today, I was actually reading one of the Old Testament's strange stories. We've just read parts of that. And as I reflected on one of what is admittedly, as we get into it, one of the strange stories in the Old Testament, it occurred to me that this story really did summarize for me a few things I've learned since I graduated from Newbold. We find the story, as we've just looked at it, in 1 Samuel chapters 5 and 6. The situation at the beginning can hardly be worse because the Philistines have just defeated Israel. The defeat and the humiliation are bad enough, but what really hurts is the exile, the exile of God. That's what we read. If you look at the end of the previous episode, at the end of chapter 4, one of the daughters-in-law, the high priest, Eli, tragically dies a short time after giving birth, but before she does so, she says this. This is chapter 4, verse 21. She named the child Ichabod, meaning the glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God had been captured and because of her father-in-law and her husband. So the ark, her father-in-law, her husband, all gone, but of greatest importance placed first here, is the Ark of the Covenant. And it's so important that it's repeated in the next verse. Chapter 4, verse 22. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the Ark of God has been captured. The glory of Israel has departed. Gone. Not simply gone, but taken. Taken to the land of the Philistines, Israel's greatest enemy, God himself, a refugee. So, what happens to God in the refugee camp of the Gaza Strip in the land of Philistia? Well, this is what happens. 
when the Philistines capture the Ark of the Covenant, they think they have captured Israel's God. That's what they say. Just before the battle that has taken place, the Israelites bring the ark into the camp. A great shout goes up from the Israelite army, and the Philistines say, gods have come into the camp. So when the Philistines capture the ark of the covenant, they take what they think is the god of the Israelites, and they put him in his place as a captive of their high god, Dagon. You see that in chapter 5, verse 2. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon and placed it beside Dagon. But have the Philistines got this right? Has the high God of the Philistines, has he really defeated the God of Israel? Well, it, it certainly looks like it because the Philistines take the ark the ark is just an insignificant box. It's about four foot long and two and a half foot wide and high, about the same size as the average IKEA flat pack. And it just sits there be beside the magnificent idol of Dagon. And the Philistines think that puts the God of Israel in his place. However, next morning, verse 3, when the people of Ashdod rose early the next day, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and put him back in his place. So would you credit it? The high God of the Philistines flat on his face before the Lord God of Israel as Paul would say later in Philippians, every knee shall bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. We get a foretaste of that here. Well, the Philistines try to restore the dignity of Dagon. They haul him back to his feet. But matters get worse because the next morning, verse 4, when they rose early on the next morning, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord, and the head of Dagon and both his hands were lying cut off upon the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. And what's the significance of that? Well, the significance is that this was the common fate of prisoners of war in the ancient Near East. In those days, before the Geneva Convention, prisoners of war frequently had their heads and their hands severed from their bodies. And here Dagon is prostrate with his head and his hands lying useless beside him. His fall is a symbol of the fact that God is sovereign. In contrast, Dagon is just a pile of rubble, like Humpty Dumpty. Humpty Dumpty sat on a wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Now, apparently, the original Humpty Dumpty was an enormous cannon used during the English Civil War at the Battle of Colchester, and the royalists put the cannon, Humpty Dumpty, on a wall. But the roundheads destroyed the wall, and Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. Rather like Dagon here, supposedly the God above all gods, but before the Lord God of Israel, he has a great fall. And so the Philistines learn that despite all appearances to the contrary, God is sovereign. Now, when I was a student here in the 1970s, I don't think I fully appreciated that. Of course, in those days, I was much younger than I am today, and also immature. And the problem with being young and immature 
is that you are, well, young and immature. And it took quite a while for me, life experiences, disappointments, heartaches, questioning faith, before I learned the same lesson, that despite all appearances to the contrary, God is sovereign. Now, when the Philistines see their smashed idol, they are in a quandary. They don't have a clue what to do. So they do what we do when we don't have a clue what to do. Move the problem somewhere else. Move the problem worker to another department. Promote the incompetent colleague to a higher position. At least she'll do less damage there. Move the incompetent pastor to another church. In other words, when you don't have a solution for your problem, make your problem somebody else's problem. And that is what the Philistines do. In fact, that principle that I've just set out for you, I think I should be honest and say, I think I learned that before I graduated uh, from Newbold. <clears throat> but the Philistines, the Philistines move the ark from Ashdod where it is onto Gath and onto Ekron, and it causes havoc wherever it goes. Chapter 5, verse 6. The hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and struck them with tumors, both in Ashdod and in its territory. Now, what afflicted the Philistines isn't entirely clear. It was some kind of swelling. Now, the version I'm reading here, the New Revised Standard, as well as the New King James that was used for the scripture reading, it translates it as tumors. But there are many well-placed Hebrew scholars who believe that what it actually refers to is hemorrhoids. Uh, more on that in just a moment. But the ark causes havoc wherever it goes until the penny finally drops. Let's send the ark of the covenant back to Israel. Why are we going to send it back to Israel? Because we can't deal with it. Why can't we deal with it? Because God is sovereign. Now, I mentioned... Well, let's look at chapter 6, verse 4 first. Uh, so they decide they're going to send the ark back to Israel, and now they're deciding exactly how to do this. What shall we send back with it? Chapter 6, verse 4. They said, what is the guilt offering that we should return to him? That is, what should we send with the ark back to Israel? And they answered, five gold tumors, or hemorrhoids, and five gold mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines, for the same plague was upon all of you and upon your lords. Now, I mentioned that this is a strange story, and golden hemorrhoids is about as strange as it can get, I would uh, suggest to you. Now, when we say that God is sovereign, this doesn't mean that everything that happens to us in our lives. Every action, every thought, everything we say or do has all been dictated by God. It doesn't mean that everything that has happened to those of us who were here at Newbold in the 1970s, everything that's happened to us since then was all predetermined from all, all eternity. Fatalistically, we've experienced that. That every single tragedy, heartache has been directed to us directly by God. But it does mean that God is over all. God's will might not always be done. In fact, it might rarely be done. But in the end, God rules. Because God is sovereign. But in this story, the Israelites aren't so sure. They think that God has been sent to exile. Remember what that lady said, 
the glory, the glory of Israel, that is God, has departed. The glory has departed. God is in exile. And sometimes, as Christians, I think perhaps we can think the same thoughts because God perhaps can sometimes seem in exile. For example, in a growing secular society, growing um, aggression in some cases against the gospel and, and faith in general, so that God seems to be banished from life. But sometimes, I believe, we ourselves can send God into exile. I experienced that too after I graduated from Newbold. My lecturing career uh, began when I was asked to teach at Avondale College in Australia. I landed there as a 28-year-old in the middle of the fiercest and hottest theological controversy of the 20th century. It was a nice, gentle introduction. This was a time when theology, doctrine, was never more discussed, and a time when God never seemed so far away, in exile much of the time. And yet this strange story in 1 Samuel that we're looking at I believe, reassures us. Even when the Israelites believed that God was in exile, God is sovereign. And something else. When the Philistines captured the Ark of the Lord, they didn't capture God himself. And that is an important distinction to make. When the Philistines capture the ark, they treat it as an idol, and they put it beside the idol of their god, Dagon. But there's a problem with idols. When we make an image of God, we confine him. We capture him by the works of our own hands. And once we've captured him, contained him, then we can move on to control him, manipulate him for our own purposes. But here, the Philistines learn that they cannot manipulate God. And of course, neither can we. And that was another lesson I learned after I graduated from Newbold. Now, I don't think we would ever do this on purpose, but it is easy to slip into the dangerous area of trying to manipulate God, especially through theology. Believe me, I'm a theologian. Take our fundamental beliefs, for example. Fundamental beliefs, I believe we need them. They are good in themselves, but every good thing often comes with a danger. And as you are probably aware, as time goes on, uh, we edit our fundamental beliefs, make them more precise, more detailed. Like those annual reports I used to write for the Department of Theological Studies. Every version is longer than the one before. And the reason we do that is usually to counter challenges to the faith of the church. We want to make sure that we put the church right on this and that. But we need to be careful in doing that. That in adjusting our fundamental beliefs we don't end up trying to control more than just the church. We need to be careful that we don't try to control God. 
Let me explain this way. When we say, um, for example, you see, look, there is God. Explained, explored, defined in 4,646 words. Once we've done that, there's no going back. Just more and more detail added with the risk that we begin to restrict God to the words that we use about him. And if, if that were to happen, then we have mistaken the shadow, theology, or doctrine for the reality, the living God. And if we get to that point, then we are trying to manipulate God just like the Philistines thought they were able to do here. Now, the difference between God himself and our human descriptions of him, uh, let me illustrate it this way. There is a significant difference between photographs of the glorious Yorkshire Dales and experiencing the Yorkshire Dales. A few years ago, you know, my wife, Anne, and I, we would look at photographs of the Yorkshire Dales and we'd say, someday, let's go. Someday, let, let's go. But these days, uh, we don't look at photographs of the Yorkshire Dales very much. And the reason for that is that we live there. We experience the Yorkshire Dales. We walk through the Yorkshire Dales. We stand and look at a stunning landscape and drink it in. And we say, oh, if only this were Bracknell. <laughs> you know, I, I, I jest. But my, my point is, we have discovered, we have discovered an irrefutable truth. Notice my diction. An irrefutable truth that photographs of the Yorkshire Dales do not do justice to the beauty of the Yorkshire Dales, and likewise, theology doesn't do justice to the living God. And we should pr stop pretending that it does. If we don't, we might find that we are manipulating God through the very language we use to describe him. So after I graduated from Newbold, I learned first that even when God seems to be in exile, he is sovereign. And second, we cannot manipulate God because he is sovereign. And something else. When the ark was exiled in Philistia, the Israelites were completely absent. They were on the outside looking in. But God overcame the Philistines without any help whatsoever from Israel because God is sovereign. And the ark comes home because God is sovereign. Look at chapter 6 and verse 10. They took two milk cows and yoked them to the cart. So they have the ark on the back of the cart and they took two milk cows, yoked them to the cart, shut up their calves at home. Verse 12, the cows went straight in the direction of Beth Shemesh, along one highway, lowing as they went. They turned neither to the right nor to the left, and the lords of the Philistines went after them as far as the border of Beth Shemesh. This is the second time that the ark of the Lord has entered Israel. The first time, the Israelites carried it in. They carried it in across the waters of the Jordan. The second time the ark enters the land of Israel, it comes home by itself, sitting on a cart, pulled by two cows, who decide where they're going. Nobody leads them. 
This is a rerun of the Exodus, but this time with a significant twist, because this time there isn't an Israelite in sight. God comes home in his own power and in his own way, because God is sovereign. When I was a student at Newbold in the 1970s, I remember having a fairly clear view on what my responsibilities were and what the responsibilities of the church were. I remember saying, you know, God has no hands but our hands. Well, yes. And as Jan Paulson would say, and no. Because while it is true, on the one hand, that God does work through us, on the other hand, not always. And here, God acts on his own. Perhaps it might be an idea to give God a bit more space to do things in his way. At the very least, it might reduce our organizational ego. So after I graduated from Newbold, I learned first that even though God seems to be in exile, he is sovereign. We can't manipulate God because he is sovereign. And although God obviously does use us and want to use us, he doesn't actually need us because he is sovereign. And after I graduated from Newbold, I did learn one more thing. This story, which seems to sum up much of my experience, it begins with tragedy. The glory has departed. But it ends with victory, with the glory returned. It begins with humiliation, the humiliation of exile. It ends with exuberant worship around the ark back in the land. And that won't be the last time where the apparent humiliation of God is turned around to victory. In the second chapter of Philippians, Paul writes these famous words, Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 5. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form, he humbled himself, became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And therefore God has also highly exalted him, and gave him the name that is above all, every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Humiliation turned to glory. And something I learned in my ministry after Newbold was a growing conviction that it isn't enough for us simply to hope, simply to believe that God will, at some time, turn things around that he'll turn things around in the future. Amen, yes he will. But in the meantime, I think we need to give the world a foretaste of what we expect that new world to be. And if we think we cannot change the world, at least we could have a go at trying to change the church. So that it truly is a place of freedom rather than oppression a community of joy rather than fear, and a place of 
gospel creativity rather than dull orthodoxy. As I read this odd story from the Old Testament, I also realized something else, and that is that I encounter God in unpredictable ways. And one of the ways I realize that I encounter God is through seemingly strange biblical stories, such as this one, of idols falling over, golden hemorrhoids, and cows wandering down the road. In reality, this story, I believe, does give us an insight into the ways in which God operates in this world and operates in our lives. But first, even when God seems to be in exile, he is sovereign. Second, we cannot manipulate God because he is sovereign. Third, God might well use us, but he doesn't actually need us because he is sovereign. And fourth, tragedy will turn to victory because God is sovereign. These are just a few things I've learned since I graduated from Newbold.